Hello, everyone. Welcome to the exhibitor track. I'm Hitesh Bambani, a volunteer in the OWASP community, and I'll be helping moderate this session. During the next 45 minutes, we'll be listening to Isaac. Um, yeah, and he's presenting a talk on flipping the script on application security. Okay. So while we're while the session is going on, uh, feel free to submit any questions you have in the Q&A tab. That's going to be found on the right of this video in the HUA platform. And I'll be asking Isaac those questions on your behalf in the last 10 minutes of the session. There's also a chat function, um, and you can leave comments and chat in, in HUA platform itself. Okay. So our speaker today, Isaac Cohen is a senior director of field security products at GitHub. And, and their mission is to help organizations ship software securely. Isaac discovered his passion for automation while leading transformations in DevSecOps at large financial service companies. And then from working in the center of CI CD world there, Isaac has extensive knowledge of DevSecOps ecosystem practices and how to increase code quality. And, um, and what we all want is decrease the time to ship secure code. With that said, uh, Isaac, please take it. Thank you so much, Hitesh. Uh, so, so excited to be talking to you all today. Uh, I'm gonna to be talking about what it means to actually flip the script on application security as we, as we really know it today. Um, I have split this talk into three sections. So we're first going to talk about the state of application security today. Only once we understand um, the, the state of application security today will we be able to understand more of the, the challenges that we face uh, improving application security. And then we'll go through what it means to, to actually have a, a developer first approach, a developer first approach to security. So let's begin. The state of application security today. We've probably, you, you've probably seen this slide beforehand, right? Like the truth is we all want to shift security left. I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? If you find a bug, if you find a vulnerability further on in the life cycle, it's going to cost exponentially more than if you found it earlier on in that life cycle. And so we see some of the numbers over here, right? Like if you find an issue in development, very cheap to fix, $80. You find a, an issue in production, much more expensive, right? Like it's, it's exponential at that point, 7,600. Of course, you never want to get to a breach that, you know, $4 million, in, that, that's never where you want to go. But the interesting thing when I look at this, this chart, when I look at this idea of shifting left, is that we've been talking about this for a very long time. We've been talking about shifting left for at least a decade. In fact, if we go back a decade, we, we can actually see that the same chart that I was looking at with all the fancy uh, graphs um, in the previous chart, you, you can see that this was actually a, a survey uh, um, done by, by the IBM team for their sales team. Um, and, and essentially what they found was the same thing, right? Like if you find an issue, you find a bug during development, it's much cheaper. But you can actually see that the numbers are even the same, right? It's $80 for defect over there. Finding it in production is $7,600. So we've been talking about shift left for at least this, the, the last decade. My question is always going to be why? Like why are we still talking about this shift left concept? We're also introducing vulnerabilities at, at the same rate. So at GitHub, because GitHub is really the center of, of software, right? like we're the center of the open source ecosystem, we see a lot of the trends within software happening. And, and so the GitHub data science team did an analysis on about 70 million lines of open source code. So we could think about these projects like the Kubernetes project or the Linux kernel. And what we did was we mapped the amount of lines of code to the amount of security threats that were being introduced over time. 
And what we noticed was that there was, there was this linear rate. There was a linear relationship between those two lines. So you could see the purple line being the lines of code, the, the bluish green line being the, the, uh, the security threats. If we've been talking about shifting left since 2012, why do we still have a linear relationship between lines of code and security threats? I'll push this a little bit further. You may say this is only open source, but Microsoft is actually the largest corporate contributor to open source, which means that the same developers who are contributing to open source are actually working within your enterprises as well. Um, and, and so I, I think that this is even probably even worse within the enterprise, but but we're still introducing vulnerabilities at the same rate. We're also relying on, on more code with, with vulnerabilities. So we have a function at, at GitHub. It's what's known as dependency alerts. Uh, pretty much whenever you check in a dependency, we'll, we will scan to figure out if there's a known CVE associated with it, a known vulnerability associated with it. Um, this is what we term as dependency alerts. We've been doing this for the open source and for enterprises for about the last four or five years. And so we see trends. And what's interesting to look at over here is that there's been a 40% increase from 2019 to 2020 of dependency alerts that we are sending out, which means that it's not just that we are introducing vulnerabilities into our code, but the dependencies that we're using are also introducing vulnerabilities, which we are relying on. So we are relying on more code, more code from the open source um, with, with more vulnerabilities as well. And so this presents a, a, a unique challenge. Another interesting chart that we have, um, one of the things that GitHub does as well as we, we alert users if they check in a secret into, into GitHub. We've actually been doing this on the GitHub side for probably the last 10 years. Uh, pretty much like what we did was whenever you checked in a GitHub secret, we would automatically invalidate it on our side if it made it into an open source repository. That way there's, there's really no risk of putting in a personal access token of uh, get a personal access token into GitHub, like you can try it. Within a couple of seconds, it will, it will be revoked on our end. But what we did was we, we wanted to track the amount of GitHub access tokens that are being leaked into public repositories. And you can actually use this as a proxy for other secrets that are being leaked into open source projects. Um, so it's not just GitHub access tokens that get leaked into open source projects. It's AWS and Azure and GCP and Heroku uh, secrets that get leaked in. Um, and so what we found with specifically with GitHub access tokens was that there's a huge increase as well, actually 60% year over year of tokens being leaked every single month into, into open source projects. Again, like you can start to multiply this out when you think about all of the other service providers that have this issue. So we know that more credential leaks are happening more than ever. We also know that they are incredibly, um, I mean, they can be catastrophic, but like we've seen a lot of the past year where a, a hacker might get into your network or, or get into a repository, but they immediately start to elevate access just because they found the credential that was in a repository. Um, and, and so this has been a, a, a huge issue, and it's just interesting to see how, how big of an issue it, it continues to be. But what is the most ca common cause of, of breaches today? Well, well, let's look at this. So we look at the Verizon data breach investigations. Uh, the, the number one is web app attacks. Um, over here, it's web app attacks. I think this is 2018 now, it's web, web, web app attacks. Um, continuing on, it, it consistently, the number one issue for intrusions have been the web application. Interestingly enough, it hasn't been the firewall configuration. Well, like all those things are very, very important, 
But the number one reason is, is usually a, a web app attack today. So we know that there are issues, like this is the state of application security today. Like th this is where we've been over the past couple of years. And so the big question that I'm asking, of course, is why? Why is it such an issue? Well, there are challenges to, to improving application security. So let, let's talk about them for a minute. One thing that we need to know is that security teams are vastly outnumbered. Like as personally as a developer, I need to have a lot of empathy for our security teams because there's just, there's so little of them compared to the amount of developers out there. So it, we estimate there's about 40 million professional developers out there. There's only 70K security researchers. 570 to 1. Even in the enterprise, we see that number to be about 100 to 1. So you have a, in the enterprise, you have about 100 developers to every one security person. We don't see this as getting better, right? 82% 82 of IT security professionals say their, their team is understaffed. Um, this year, 70% of ISA members believe their organization has been impacted by a global cybersecurity skills shortage. The reality is, is that in, in cybersecurity, there's, it's, a, it's just a zero sum game today. There's just not enough people. The other issue over here is that securing soft, uh, first party software is really just, just the beginning. As we were mentioning beforehand, you have your code, but increasingly you're using a lot more open source code. So we, we estimate about 30% of, of first party code uh, of your application is first party code. 70% uh, is actually open source code. That's scary because that, what that means is that you are literally giving production level access to a person who does not work for your company who you've never met. Um, and so securing first party software is, is really just the first start of this discussion, right? The 70% is not being covered by any dedicated security team. Last thing that I'll, I'll leave you with over here is that security just isn't part of the developer workflow today. Um, Verico did this analysis on, on SaaS scans per year what they found was that less than 10% of people are, are actually scanning more than once a week. More than once a week, right? Like less than 10% are actually scanning more than once a week. By far the most common um, use case over here is you're, you're running a SaaS scan once every year for your application. So how can we ever detect the, the vulnerabilities if the adoption rate is so low? If it's not, if security, if SAS is not part of the developer workflow. You know, it was interesting. Uh, about a year ago, I personally ran this, this poll with 100 enterprise customers. This wasn't a scientific poll. Um, this is just, I, I just wanted to read the rune. I just wanted to understand where we are as an industry. And so I asked them, how integrated are your SAS practices today? And it was super interesting to learn. Um, there, were, there were a couple of options. One was you don't have any SaaS. Two was you run SaaS periodically. Three was you, you have integrated SaaS as part of your CI. So 38%, a scary 38% said they're not running SaaS today. Again, that's a very scary statistic for me. 23% um, said they're running SaaS periodically. 33% said they've integrated SAS as part of their CI. But I didn't stop there. There was a fourth choice, a fourth hidden choice, which was, do your developers actually trust the results from the automated CI, right? This is the fourth level. And it was a mere 5% that said developers actually trusted their automated SAS results. I'm going to challenge you right now. 
if we're integrating SaaS as part of their CI, that, that's great. But if developers don't actually trust the results, they're not actually going to fix the issues. Once you start to, to, to disbelieve the results that you're getting from, from the tooling that you have, it starts to become a waste of time for you as a developer. And so to me, the big issue today within the industry is that developers don't actually trust the tools that we've given them. It's very nice that we're trying to shift left, but we're shifting left using the same tools that were designed for security engineers. They were not designed for developers. And so that, that's a huge mindset shift. That changes the game. This is probably why we see such a low fix rate. We also see such a low adoption rate from the developers. Before I dive deeper into this, I, I, I wanna take a pause for a second and talk about this, this, this painting. So in the middle, is an individual, this is actually a, a painting of, of surgery happening in the 1800s. In the middle is an individual named Joseph Lister. Joseph Lister is known as the, the father of modern day surgery. On the left hand side is an anesthesiologist. That anesthesiologist is um, putting the patient to sleep. That way surgery can be performed. On the right-hand side is an individual spraying an antiseptic spray. That way germs don't get in to, uh, to the body while it's opened. So this is a painting of, of really surgery happening in the 1800s. The interesting thing though, is that the anesthesia on the left and the antiseptic spray on the right those two technological innovations, which is what they were, they were technological innovations in the 1800s, took radical, radically different adoption curves. Let's actually explore this. Let's understand a little bit more. Um, let, let's actually first talk about anesthetics. So it's important to go back to surgery pre-1800s. Surgery pre-1800s, you had a an individual, a patient that was very much awake. They were writhing in agony. It was a very painful experience, as you would imagine. Um, but also, there was about a 50% mortality rate because there were no antiseptics, right? Like germs would get in and the, the person would die from sepsis afterwards. And so surgery was a very dangerous operation coming in at the 1800s. Surgeons had to complete surgery as quickly as possible because again, the person is writhing in pain. Uh, you could also imagine, right, like when you're doing surgery, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, the individual doesn't move too much, but that's very, very difficult in this case. And so the first innovation that I'm going to talk about is anesthetics. Um, anesthetics was developed uh, initially by, by William Morton. He was a dentist. Um, he took this to Henry J. Bigelow. And Henry J. Bigelow saw this and said, I can change surgery with anesthetics. Um, again, like this was first discovered in 1846. What's interesting is once Henry J. Bigelow started to write about this and started to say, I can change surgery, it was actually being experimented on in all major cities within a year. Not only that, it became ubiquitous within the industry within seven years. Why? Well, it, it just, it made the surgeon's lives much easier. You can perform surgery when a person is, is, is not writhing in agony, and when a person is, is sleeping. So this got adopted extremely quickly, but there was a very different adoption curve with antiseptics. Um, antiseptics was, it was first discovered in 1865 by Joseph Lister. What Joseph Lister postulated was there were germs in the air that probably made it into your body. And, and he termed as sewage, right? He didn't really know about germs. He knew about sewage in the air. Um, and, and so he was operating on a seven-year-old child who had a fractured lead, a, a leg and said, 
maybe this carbolic acid can, can help. Uh, this carbolic acid being an antiseptic. Well, he tried that and it seemed to work. And so experiment after experiment, what he found was that the rates of survival with antiseptics, with carbolic acid, was, was really, really good. It was much better than it was beforehand. He published a study in The Lancet, which is the premier journal. And, and you would expect at that point that everybody starts to use it. But what's interesting over here is that it was highly divisive. Surgeons did not want to adopt antiseptics. They did not want to adopt carbolic acid, even though it was proven time and time again that this was saving lives. And the, the reason why this was so highly divisive, and this is the core, this is the crux of the story, carbolic acid burned the surgeon's eyes. It hurt. It was annoying to the surgeon. It burned the hands and the eyes of the surgeon. And so even though it showed much better rates, surgeons didn't like it. And so this was actually half-heartedly adopted by the mid-1880s, right? Like that's 20, that, that's, um, that's 15 years of still being half-heartedly adopted where anesthetics took a very, very different adoption curve. Let's bring this back to DevSecOps. And by the way, that's considered the foundation of modern surgery. Let's bring this down to DevSecOps. My argument over here is going to be that DevOps is like anesthesia. It made sense. I mean, who doesn't want to ship software faster? Right? Everybody wants to. Um, it, it, it figured out the relationship between dev and ops, leading to a smoother relationship. Um, it just worked, and people loved it. But DevSecOps, or, or really security today, still feels like we're, we're spraying carbolic acid on our developers. It's very painful. We know we need to do it. We know the rates are much better if we do security early on, but man, is it painful. Like, doesn't that, it, it, developers still just, just absolutely don't like that process. It still feels like we're spraying carbolic acid on them. And so this is why the adoption curve between DevOps and, and DevSec has been so different. Um, so, so now the question becomes, what if we started to design for the developers? Right, like what if we started to design products and security products? What, what does a developer first application security approach actually look like? So GitHub has actually been in this game for a while. As I was mentioning beforehand, we've been doing this, we've been looking for known CVEs within vulnerabilities, within your open source projects for, for a good amount of time now, about the last, four or five years. Um, but we started with sending out vulnerability e alert emails. And we thought this was the best thing, right? We are going to send the developers an email anytime a vulnerability is found within, uh, anytime a CVE from a dependency that they're using is found within their application. They don't have to do anything. Like, we'll just do this in the background. It'll be great. You don't have to configure anything. But what we found was that developers didn't love it. They were getting spammed with vulnerability alert emails. Um, there, there, there was just too much noise being sent to them. The key over here though, is that we were showing them problems without giving them solutions. We were showing them tons of problems, but we were never actually saying how, telling them how to fix it. And so later on, we developed what's known as Dependabot, where we'll open up a pull request for the developer. So once we know that there's a, a, a vulnerability associated with that dependency, why don't we just open up a PR for you? That way the developer just has to click that button, just has to click that button to merge the issue. Well, we'll even run your CI checks. That way you're confident that there's no API breaking changes associated with that. And we'll give you a compatibility score based off of our data, we think that this is going to be compatible. Again, like giving you all of the information necessary so that all you have to do is click that button to actually resolve the issue. Well, we saw a dramatic, a, a dramatic effect. So for folks who are using Dependabot security update um, pull requests, they actually fix issues in half the time it takes 
versus the folks who don't use depend upon. Actually showing the developer, giving the developer a solution just changed the game. Whereas beforehand, we were, we were developing something that was outside of developer workflow. Again, like we're sending them emails, external email, but focusing on the problem. It was, it was really just automating the start of the journey. We now were at the heart of the developer workflow. We were in the application that they know and love. We were focusing on a solution. We were actually entire, it, it, automating the entire life cycle of this. Being a developer or designing for developers requires a mindset shift. It requires you to think about things in a little bit of a different manner. Let's do another, let's do an example now. What does it mean to have a developer first credential scanning solution? Remember how, how we were saying leaked credentials is a huge problem within the industry. Um, it's something that continues to plague the industry, but what does it mean to create a developer first credential scanning solution? Well, firstly, credential scanning is, is really the, probably the perfect candidate to shift left. Um, as I was mentioning beforehand, it's extremely common. About 100 GitHub tokens leak into GitHub every single day. Um, it's extremely damaging, like going back to solar and solar winds one, two, three, right? Like that, that was part of the major issue that, that led to a breach. Um, it's, it's also, it's, it's pretty easy to detect, right? Like you don't need that much. You need a couple of regexes. Maybe you'll do some post-processing to, to get rid of the, the false positives. That's really it. Um, today, in GitHub especially, we, we've been really, really good at prevention, but, but what does it mean to actually, we've been really good at remediation, but what if we could actually prevent this? What if we could actually prevent a secret from ever making it into GitHub? Right, again, again, like this is from ever making it into your source code repository, this is the perfect candidate to shift left. Like we should just stick this in as part of a pre-receive hook. But what's the issue over here? The catch is always false positives. This has been the thing that that's, this has been the reason why pre-received hooks have been so hard to implement. It's just whenever a developer gets a false positive, it's extremely breaking, right? Like they now have to figure out what to do with this secret that's probably a false positive. Um, there's not too much information that's generally given to them. So there's a lot of, digging into this is also just extremely annoying it's extremely annoying for a developer because specifically um on a 5 p.m on a friday night they, they just want to commit their code they don't want to be blocked by a false positive so we have to be very very careful about noise when it comes to the developer this is something that we know noise is is, is we need to optimize for noise over there because otherwise developers will throw out the entire solution. Um, we actually rolled this within Microsoft for, for a good amount of time. Um, and, and what we found was, right, like in, in this case, developers are responsible for triaging findings, noisy patterns, there's always an escape hatch. What happened at Microsoft was we found that the rate of false positives was extremely high. Um, but developers were so frustrated that about 3% of them were actually scripting things um, so that whenever a, a, an, an issue is found in a pre-received hook, it would automatically say it's a false positive. That's a huge issue, right? Like, the, the issue was such a big problem that developers are now scripting to try and get around this gate. So what if we were to, to change this? What if we were to design around the developer experience? Think about the developer. Well, the first thing is we need a better triage experience. We, we actually, we should give you the exact lines of code that are the issue, not just, uh, not just look at this line. Like, let's give you as much information as you can within the terminal, because that's where you're living right now. Um, if, it, if it is an issue, if it is a false positive, Let's link you to a UI so that way you could dismiss that forever and you don't ever have to worry about that. 
In fact, what about things with a, what about results with a high false positive rate? We may know that a specific token type has a high false positive rate. Well, maybe that shouldn't live within a, within a pre-receive. Maybe that should just happen within the pull request. Maybe that should just be part of your remediation workflow. We have to think about that. Um, the, the other question that I'm going to ask, right, if I'm a developer, why are we scanning things at commit time? Maybe we should just embed it in as part of your IDE. Lastly, what if we can change the industry on false positives? Part of the issue with false positives is that the industry's tokens aren't very readily identifiable. So what if we can start to change the industry to make them much more identifiable, to have a slug in the beginning that says GH, oh, GH, I know automatically this is a GitHub token. Um, to have the secret, but, but to maybe also add in check digits so that I can mathematically prove that this is probably a valid secret. These are all the things that we've been thinking at, about at GitHub. Um, some of these are already available. Um, some of them we're still very much thinking about. But the point over here is that we need to actually start the designing around the developer. And when we do, this, this very much changes the way we act and react. It's not just about sticking all of the secrets in as part of our pre-receive. We actually have to think about what's appropriate for the developer. I'm going to go through one more work example, which is developer first static analysis. As we saw beforehand, still only under 10% of folks are running static analysis um, more than once a week. Well, what if we designed around the developer? What does that actually mean? Well, the state of static analysis today, we scan for code for vulnerable. Like if you think about what static analysis is, is scanning for your code for vulnerable patterns. Uh, the big problem is that there's often thousands of results. If you are a security engineer, this is fine. You will find the needle in the haystack. But if you've now taken that same tool that finds thousands of results and stuck it in as part of the developer process, developers are going to be very frustrated because they don't have time to look through thousands of results. That's not what they should be focused on. Results today are very much owned by the security team. And so a lot of times, even if you're running it early on, security team has to review it. Maybe they'll send over a PDF to the development team to say, oh, we think these are are the actual issues. But then even from there, most of them are not actually issues. Like these are the issues that developers face on a day. Like this is the pain that a developer has with the state of static analysis today. Well, we think that it should be different. If we actually design for the developer, static analysis should feel like an automated security review. Um, it, should, it should happen at pull request time at code review time, right? You open up a pull request and you get really good results within the PR. Um, and you'll be able to comment on that, right? Like this is, it should feel like, like a, a security expert is actually reviewing your code. It should also produce accurate and relevant results. Um, we believe the bar should be a 90% fix rate. We're not there yet as an industry. But this is what we need to do. Um, this actually, this number comes from, from Google. Google, between 2008 and 2012, was using spot bugs. They developed this whole, whole portal for it, but what they found was that developers didn't use it. So they said, let's, let's create issues for developers. But then they found that only 14% of that was actually being fixed. Like these were real issues, like the most real, but linting stuff but still only 14% were being fixed. Then they moved into the pull request um, and, and they found that some rules were great, but some rules were very, very noisy and developers absolutely hated the noise. And what they found was really the rate that it should be is, is 90%. Like that's the rate that we need to aim for in order for developers to actually trust the tool. Developers will trust the tool when we get to a 90% fix rate. This is hard, but it's not impossible. It's actually very, very possible. 
The other thing is that a, a great experience should also include suggestions, right? Like let's, let's point you towards the solution. And then finally, we should be aggregating the world's security efforts. Today, there are single vendors that are, are working on, on their solutions, but, but, we, but we should actually be engaging the rest of the world in our security efforts in a very real way, in this very same way that GitHub has done this for open source, where, we've open, where we've, we're relying on developers all over the world for software, we should be relying on security experts all over the world for their security knowledge. So we should be aggregating the world's security efforts. Again, like this is how automated security review, this is how static analysis should be. This is actually what we're building at GitHub, right? This is specifically what we're building at GitHub. We are building a developer first security application. And so when I think about this, I think about it in a number of different portions. One area that we very heavily invested in was code scanning. Um, about three years ago, we acquired a company known as Semmel. Semmel was creating this really interesting technology known as CodeQL. What CodeQL does is it's pretty much a, a very advanced semantic code analysis engine. We actually load your code into a semantic database. Um, and then we run what's known as a CodeQL query. Those CodeQL queries are looking for specific patterns. So if I think about something like a SQL injection, I'm looking for information coming in from an unsecured source, let's say a REST API, um, human input. And then I'm looking for that data to flow to something like an execution against a database, you know, an, an unsafe sync from source to sync. Those are the types of things that CodeQL can look for. But the interesting thing over here and the key over here is that CodeQL is actually, we've actually open sourced the CodeQL queries, which means that if you go to github.com slash github slash CodeQL, you can see every single query that we've open sourced. The key over there is that the rest of the world can now start to, to develop these CodeQL queries. And then if you are using code scanning and CodeQL, you can start to benefit from that. But we've taken that technology and integrated it directly in as part of GitHub, as part of the native developer workflow. So that developers are used to the tools that they're using, but it's integrated intimately as part of the pull request, as part of the tools that they love. Part of CodeQL is for compiled languages, we require a build. And there's a really good reason for that. We glean a lot of information off of your build. We're able to see not only your code, but how your code is actually built. And that allows us to weed out a lot of false positives. So in general, like when you run CodeQL, you will see that there's a lot less noise. This is something that we've specifically um, spent a lot of time doing because the reality is if we do want to shift left, we need to reduce that noise. And so when I think about some of the CodeQL queries that have been developed, most of them have been developed by GitHub. That's the core circle. But then there's that community powered aspect, right? Like the vast community of, 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 of researchers of, of Microsoft and Google Project Zero and Uber um, security engineers contributing back to the GitHub CodeQL query base. That way, when a new zero day comes in, comes out, we can now have a query to address that very, very quickly. The other thing I think about as well that we're building at GitHub is, is secret scanning. For a very long time, as I mentioned, we were detecting secrets anywhere in your Git history. Um, and this is not just for GitHub, this is actually all sorts of tokens out there. I think there's over 250 token types today that we, that we, that we support, whether it's Azure, AWS, GC, you know, the, the large cloud providers, um, or if you have any, any ones that you'd like us to partner up, let us know, of course. But for a long time, this was just remediation. We just detected it as, as part of when you automatically in the background when you check something in. But I, I'm, I'm really happy that about two months ago, we actually released what we term as push protections. 
where today we can we can block secrets that from ever making it into github again like this is that area that we want to be in um, and, and we're taking that developer first approach we're trying very we're first enabling the secrets that have the lowest false positive rate that way we don't annoy that developer we're trying to give them as much information as possible within the commit that way they can easily make a decision of whether this is a real issue or not and then finally like we're redirecting them to a ui that way they can dig in deeper but also also notate this as false positive or not this is a huge step in the industry of preventing these credential leaks from ever occurring in the first place. And then finally, I think about, about that depend about, uh, about updating dependencies for the latest functionality, seeing the risk introduced from dependencies directly within the pull request. That way you never actually introduce that as part of your main or master branch. Um, we're, we're even going a little further. I don't, I don't know if you've seen this, but we, we released vulnerability exposure analysis which allows us now to, to surface if your code is actually calling the vulnerable code. Again, we're trying to give the developer as much information as possible. That, they, that way they understand the priority of the vulnerability um, and they can just click that merge button if there's an issue. This is, this is all built in as part of the, the native GitHub platform. And so we're trying, like this is what we're talking about of shifting the mindset from from security engineer only focused to being developer first focused. You can check out a lot more information on github.com slash features slash security on what we're building over here. Uh, I, I just wanted to end on, on a couple of closing thoughts. Firstly, if we build for developers, we very much believe that we can shift that. We very much believe that we can change this chart that we see of scanning of less than 10% scanning more than once a week to having it just built in as part of your, your standard process. We also believe that if, if we can work together, we can do more. It, it's not just a specific individual, a specific security engineering company. We as a, global, as a global community need to work on this together, which is why GitHub is so, so interested about in this area. Um, it's because software lives on GitHub. So, so we need to start working together more in order to figure this out. If we build tools that developers love and work together, we can actually secure the open source. Again, it's all about getting that, that developer love and that developer mindset over here. And then finally, DevSecOps is a slow idea. It takes time, but slow ideas can change the world. Joseph Lister and, and, the, um, and, the, and the carbolic acid that he created and that he used took a really long time in order to change modern sur surgery, but he is the father of modern surgery. And now there is not one surgery room that doesn't use antiseptics. And so in that same manner, DevSecOps, it's taking its time, but it will change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Very informative talk. Um, so let me remind the attendees that we are now open to uh, submit, they can submit Q&A in the Q&A tab. That should be part of your whole platform. So I will wait for some attendees uh, to send us uh, questions. Uh, Isaac, I was wondering like, what your thoughts are about, uh, you know, why developers, you know, they don't trust the SAS results and um, yeah, the, the automated SAS results. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes to a lot of what I was saying. Um, today, a lot of the, the tools that were created, um, A, are very, very noisy, which, which always adds a lot of complexity for developers. I mean, developers absolutely hate that. Um, B, that, there, there's that, that generally there's a separate portal that they have to go into that wasn't designed for them. 
Um, a lot of times not integrated as part of like pull requests and stuff. Um, and so like when you have those three factors together, that, that's usually what causes a lot of angst amongst developers. Um, I, I personally am a, a developer, not day to day, but I, anymore, um, but I still very much develop in open source and whatnot. And I can tell you when there's too much, fun, I just shot it down. I, I just, I don't have time for that. Um, but but my, right, like, I think that there's a, a better way. Like, I think that we could do better in that regard. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, being a developer myself for many years, uh, yeah, I understand, uh, you know, they want to see, they're in a certain environment, they're used to that every day and they want to see things happen there, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's it's important to know I mean, for a security engineer, you want it, like a lot of times you may want to see the, the haystack, you know, and the needle versus haystack analogy. You may want to see the haystack and that totally makes sense. The problem is always the developer. The developer um, only really wants the needles. And so either we're doing this outside of the developer workflow, which means PDFs and Jira tickets are being created, um, or we can actually just integrate it in as part of that that native workflow, but we have to think about the developer's life. Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question now. Uh, it is, have you found that communicating stories from bug bounties as a means to illustrate, here's how it went wrong, to raise awareness and interest in developing software more securely? So, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that's, that's definitely a good approach, right? Like to talk about how things have gone wrong in the past. What I've done a lot is I've, I've, I've generally liked to analyze where things go wrong and try to come up with solutions to address that. Um, and a lot of times, like when you're developing, especially like an app sec security program, there's gonna be issues all over the place. And so you're gonna to have to figure out exactly where you should spend your time. Um, and so part of this is storytelling, is, is, is talking about the way things have gone wrong. But I also like to focus on how we can get it right. Like, right, like it, it's good to start with where things went wrong, but it's really, really important to paint the future of, of what could be and what we need to do um, and, and, and what we're doing in order to, to make sure that things don't go wrong again. Um, and so that's like just my general philosophy over there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and Isaac, you talked about uh, you know, secrets in the source code and uh, that, that's a huge problem. So have you seen any shift in these secrets since, uh, since GitHub has been releasing uh, these new protections? Yeah, we, we actually have. Um, so when we release push protections, we, we are seeing a, a, a drop in rate in, in secrets being integrated, in secrets being sent into to GitHub. Again, like this is still on a small scale, it's still in beta. And so over time, we expect that 90% of people using um, secret scanning are, are, are going to have push protections on and, and that will prevent a lot of issues from ever making it into GitHub, which is where we want to be. Um, so we're definitely seeing a, a huge effect um, just by using that today. Again, like it's just so easy to use. You turn it on across your organization, you don't have to think about it. Um, and, and now all of a sudden you're preventing secrets from ever making it in. So yeah, we've definitely seen a huge effect. Yes, very nice, very convenient. Yes, definitely. All right. Um, Let's check if we have any more questions from the attendees. While we wait, um, um, you were showing us about the the code QL, and that's the. Um, tied to the static analysis tools within GitHub. 
And is this a contribution to code QL from the community and security researchers? Um, can you speak example about example wise or how someone can get involved in that project? Yeah, totally. So if you go to github.com slash github slash code QL, you can actually see all the queries that we've developed. Um, and there, there's a ton of learning materials and stuff that you can get started on over there. But if you find any security vulnerabilities, what I encourage you to do is to create a code QL query and pull request it back to us. Uh, we'll review it and then we'll add it into our, our, our security suites. That way the rest of the world can start to benefit from them. And we'll also even give you money for that, right? There's a bounty that we will pay you for that. Um, We've actually seen some pretty high profile cases of that occurring. Um, and so the, the example, I think, you know, Spring for Shell, which happened earlier this year, um, back in the January, February timeframe, um, a, a security researcher, the community actually created a query within hours. Um, and, and we were able to integrate that in, uh, but, but that just shows the, the power of, of code QL which is we can, the community, even like when we don't have enough time to develop a query, the community will create the query for us. We'll just review it, um, but you can start to benefit from that immediately and integrate that in your workflows across your company immediately to ensure that you're not affected by a vulnerability like that. And so that's really what we mean by affecting the rest of the world and making sure that the rest of the world is involved in in, in, in securing our, our applications as well. Yes, yeah, very interesting. And, and it's a good way for um, experts to get involved in, in you know, helping protect against these things which keep coming up <laughs> every month or <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, just one final check for questions here. Let me take a few moments. All right, I think that's it in terms of questions for today, Isaac. And thanks again so much for the um, informative talk and, and all the efforts being done for open source community by GitHub. Thank you so much. It was really great talking to you all today and have a great rest of your day.